good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thanks for joining our um, we have a roundtable this morning uh, on the Colorado Privacy Act. My name is Pete Cooper. Uh, I'll let my uh, two other panelists introduce themselves. Um, my name is Pete Cooper again. I, I run a consulting firm called Analytics for People. Uh, I work with uh, public sector companies, politicians, campaigns. I work with all sorts of public sector data. It could be voter data. It could be uh, all different types of data all around the country. Um, many, many records, lots and lots of personal information, um, as you may or may not know. Uh, you get lots of texts around campaign, campaign time. Um, so this is, you know, there's special provisions and stuff like that um, for, uh, uh, for these types of companies and, and these types of sectors for public sector work. Um, yeah, so we're excited to, uh, excited to speak about the Colorado Privacy Act this morning, how it affects you. How many people in here are founders or work at small technology firms? Yeah, lots of people. So super excited. Um, the, the panel this morning is going to be uh, time for presentation for each of our panelists. And then we're going to uh, open it up to questions. So we want this to be a conversation, uh, and hear what questions you all have about the Colorado Privacy Act, um, how to comply, um, your thoughts on it. Um, and yeah, so I'll hand it over to Kathleen. Go ahead. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Kathleen McInerney. Um, thank you to Denver Startup Week for, for having us host this panel and for Bolsonelli for giving us the space. Um, I am the founder of a consulting firm called Informed um, Growth Strategies, and I worked with companies in all sorts of different areas, of, mostly of tech, but all sorts of different startups and companies who are looking for help, primarily in the area of privacy um, or in trust and safety and in government relations. My background is in big tech, so I started out working in privacy when I was at Yahoo many years ago when they started GDPR. Um, I was also on, it, on the global law enforcement team, um, and so we had to deal with, for the very first time, the right to be forgotten rules that came out. Um, and for a company like Yahoo, what does that mean when you're a search engine? How do you actually help someone become forgotten? Is there a right to keep that knowledge online? Um, so balancing all of the different rights that have to go with um, that are on the publicly available web and on search engines. Um, from there, I went on to eBay, where I helped incorporate a startup that was purchased by StubHub that did international secondary ticketing. Um, and then I was head of corporate affairs for a startup called Graphy, which is a, a Colombian startup. Um, and so for them, I managed government relations, public relations, started their privacy program, had to start it from scratch, working with the, the security officer of protecting confidential information for the company, and then also moving from startup mode into thinking about data and how do you protect that as one of your reputational and also business advantages. Um, so that's a little bit how I have come into this world, um, is architecting both for big technology companies and then also for still a big technology company, but more in the startup space. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I am Chris Keeler. Um, I'm a privacy attorney bounced around between firms and in-house positions. Um, started my privacy career in a firm in Wisconsin where um, I was responsible for assisting companies in building out their privacy programs to comply with GDPR at the time. Uh, subsequently, I went to a company called Dialpad. It's a global uh, voice over IP telecommunication tech company um, where I helped uh, you know, manage their GDPR compliance, CCPA, and then they expanded around the world, making sure that we were compliant with various international regulations and on top of that. Uh, after that, I went to Meta, where I was the lead privacy counsel there in charge of building out a comprehensive global privacy program. Um, what essentially, previously what had happened is they had regional privacy council building out their regional privacy. I was trying to leverage what Meta was doing in every different region to try to make global compliance more efficient across all of the jurisdictions. Um, and currently, I am at Marsh McLennan, where I am um, fulfilling a, a similar role. I'm on their International Senior Privacy Council. I'm working mainly with Europe, Asia, and uh, South Latin America um, to sort of leverage what we're doing here in the United States with all the state laws to better facilitate compliance. Um, I, I fancy myself to be an expert on how to uh, comply with regimes in in a way that makes sense for the business. I'm not somebody who is sitting here saying you need to strict 
strictly comply with everything. Uh, it should be a risk-based approach to compliance, and those are the kind of pro programs that I have been charged with putting in place multiple times. So thank you for having me. Looking forward to chatting with everybody. Um, so if you want to if you want to kick off your presentation and, and kick off your sure. minutes, let's do that, Chris. So I've got a little PowerPoint um, that is not fancy. Okay, so we're here to talk about the Colorado Privacy Act. As many of you know, the Colorado Privacy Act is one of several state privacy laws following Virginia, several iterations of California, um, multiple states have followed, uh, Montana, Utah, Connecticut. There's about 10 more bills that are about to pass. It has created a vast web of privacy compliance obligations for companies. What is unique about privacy compliance everywhere, but particularly in the United States, is that you can have a small startup company that's based in Colorado, but is collecting data on you, right? You, you are probably not dealing only with Colorado residents, and so therefore you're probably going to have multiple uh, compliance obligations. The other unique factor is that depending on your business model, your obligations under the Colorado law and all of the other state laws are gonna change. If you are a direct consumer B2C business, you're gonna to have to implement more compliance procedures. If you are B2B and you're just dealing with other folks, your compliance obligations, they still exist. There are, there are penalties for non-compliance, but they are, they are less and you can deal, a lot, um, deal with a lot of the compliance, mainly through contractual measures with your, with your partners. Um, so when you are thinking about how do I comply with the Colorado law, there are a number of first steps that you really need to think about before jumping in and uh, and the first is what laws apply to me. Colorado is obviously one. If you are headquartered here in Colorado, chances are you're collecting data of at least one Colorado resident. It's probably going to apply in some measure to you. Uh, but if you are an internet company collecting data, having you know, consumers around the country, you really need to look at where you're gathering your data and whether or not you need to comply with all of these other laws. Now, currently, uh, right here, the US-based laws, these are the ones that have passed. Um, not all of them are effective right now. Some will come into, um, you know, the enforcement date will be later 2023, some are 2024. Uh, but they are passed, they are reality, they are happening if you're collecting data in these, com in these states or uh, residents of these states. Uh, you should probably uh, figure out how much data you're collecting and whether this will apply to you or not. Additionally, again, internet companies, borders don't exist. Are you, do you have international clients? Right? There are a dozen or many, many different <laughs> international privacy laws. Um, here are a couple, EU, UK, Canada, Brazil, there's Australia, Japan, there's one in Nigeria, there's Vietnam, it's everywhere. Additionally, there are a number of regulations that are not strict privacy regulations, but are um, data usage regulations that may or may not apply to you. Right? If you have a digital service in the EU, there's something the Digital Service Act that probably doesn't apply for startups, but is an example of a non-privacy law that might provide obligations to you. Um, now, when you're thinking about what laws can apply, you need to think about a little bit more than just do I do business in California. Um, the CCPA in California, the CPA in Colorado, they don't apply to everybody who collects data from residents of those states. There are minimum thresholds that you need to meet in order to be subject to Generally speaking, um, and this is for all of these state laws, there's a revenue minimum, generally about 25 million, or if you're processing a certain amount of data from, from residents of that state, most, most laws have that at 100,000 um, residents. The Colorado law is 100,000 residents. If you're processing data from 100,000 Colorado residents, this law applies to you. If you're processing data from 50,000, you don't need to adhere to this law. So. When you're looking at what laws apply, you really need to know what data you're dealing with, what you're collecting, and how much of it you are collecting. Um, all of these laws, the Colorado law included, define personal information or personal data very broadly. It's any data that can be used to identify 
a person. Even if you are not actively identifying a person or targeting a person through that information, if you have information, data that makes somebody identifiable hypothetically, that is personal information, personal data under these laws. Um, so the first step is really understanding what data you're collecting and whether or not that brings you subject to Colorado, California, Utah, what have you. Uh, kind of touched on this, but the second question is where are you getting it from? Okay. This can be tough, right? You know, if you have a Colorado resident who is going to school in Illinois and you're selling them something, you know, where are you collecting that data from? Does that, does that mean you are collecting a Colorado resident's data? How, you know, when you're adding up to that 100,000 number, does that count as one of the 100,000? It is tricky. Um, there is... There are many different programs out there that help you track your data, where the data is coming from, all that kind of stuff. They're generally not cheap, but they are, if you are concerned that you're hitting that 100,000 number, they are very valuable in making sure that you know what laws apply. Uh, the second question that you really need to ask yourself is what is your data strategy? There are companies who view privacy as a business asset. Right? I need my consumers to trust me. If they trust I'm going to be honest with my data, they're going to come to me instead of a competitor. There are businesses who honestly don't really care what their consumers think. Um, if you're a B2C customer, uh, company, that idea of consumer trust is going to likely be more important than a B2B company. Right? In B2B, again, you put everything in a contract, people trust the paper, they trust the contract. If you're a B2C company, people are going to look for your reputation. So. When you are complying with multiple regulations, when you are saying, okay, how do I start complying with the Colorado regulation, you need to think about, okay, what are the expectations of my customer base, and how does that interact with the obligations of the law? Sometimes the obligations of the law are stronger than the expectations of your customer base. Sometimes it's vice versa. Understanding where you are and how you present privacy to your consumers is a big step in how you want to start crafting your compliance to Colorado, California, any of these different laws. Um, the other thing to consider is as, as you are putting together that sort of balance in your mind is looking at penalties, right? Compliance with privacy is generally a risk-based approach. You, I view privacy to be kind of like a speed limit, right? The speed limit says 65. If you're going 70, you're probably fine. Um, you know, there's always risk there, but if you're going 100 miles an hour, the risk is going to be a lot higher. And the same thing happens here. You need to balance, you know, the idea of trust of your consumers, what your reputation is, with the potential consequences. That's going to be fines from the state. That's going to be, uh, you know, bad news, uh, bad media if you get a breach or something like that. And figure out where your risk tolerance is. What is the consequences of noncompliance is more than just what's the state going to find me. It's what's that ultimate bottom line going uh, so you look at the cost of compliance, and you look at the cost of non-compliance in a total, um, you know, in, in its entirety, and figure out where you lie. And then third, there's certain low-hanging fruit that you can do, and that's going to drastically reduce your non-compliance risk, right? Privacy notice. If you are not sure whether the Colorado law applies to you, update your privacy notice to meet the Colorado standards. It'll, it'll take little time, no time at all, and you'll be able to check that off. You know, if it doesn't apply to you, it doesn't hurt. If it does apply to you, you've got that covered. So privacy notice, you know, your data subject access rights, you know, these DSAR requests. Uh, they're a requirement of almost every single privacy law out there saying, hey, if you have a consumer and they want you to delete their data, you have to delete their data. If they want to get a copy of your data, you have to give them a copy of the data, those kind of things. If you have a DSAR program already implemented, extend it to Colorado. Right? Even if you're not sure if Colorado applies to you, you extend it, it's an easy, low-hanging fruit. The record of processing activities, that's a ROPA, it's a term that comes from Europe, but the idea there is understand where your data is coming from. As we discussed before, before, if you have an idea of where your data is coming from, and the Colorado AG comes to you and say, why are you not complying with Colorado law, you can point to your ROPA and say, look, it doesn't apply. Or it does, and here are the measures that we've taken. Uh, next, third-party DPAs, DPAs being data processing agreements. 
This is huge if you have vendors or if you're a B2B company. Okay? You want to make sure that if you have vendors that are accessing your customer's data, you know what they are doing with that data and what they're allowed to do with that data. There are certain, um, certain requirements. In, in Colorado, this new law mandates DPAs if for third-party vendors, for third-party companies that access your customer's data. Um, you want to make sure that you have that in line. Yes? What is DPA? DPA is data processing addendum or data processing agreement, depending on who you talk to. So you have your master services agreement or your general sales agreement, and then there will be a mini contract at the end saying, hey, you know, you're doing my payroll, so you have access to my employee's data. You are only allowed to use that data for the, process, for the purposes of my payroll. You have to have certain security measures in place. You can't transfer it to any other one unless I see you know, and approve who it is. One other question is, uh, you were saying with the data subject access rights, how, how do you extend it? You just say, oh, OK, now I'm doing this. <laughs> kind of, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so again, all of these, the, the, the data subject access rights, these are requirements of the law. You don't have to do that if the law does not apply to you. If you're huge in California and you need those DSAR requests in California and you're tiny in Colorado and the CPA does not apply to you, you don't necessarily have to extend it. Most DSAR programs, there's informal ones, which is you provide you know, privacy at xybcorporation.com and they email you and say, please delete my data. And you can do that. Or there are one trust, trust org, all these different companies that will do it on your behalf. And when I say extend it, it just means how you react to those requests, right? If it's an automated system, they could have a drop down that says, where are you from? And it says Colorado, and then all of a sudden we know that's a legitimate DSAR request, assuming the CPA applies. If they say, hey, I'm from New Hampshire, that's not a legitimate request because they don't have the right to request deletion under the law. So when I say extend it, I just mean an internal policy that allows you to know how to react to a DSAR request from different states. Yes, yeah, so implementing it is first. And if you're a smaller startup and you're only in Colorado, you know, you could go ahead and, and purchase one trust DSAR formula for several thousand dollars, or you could create a privacy email. And in your privacy notice it says, hey, Colorado residents, email me here if you want me to delete your data. Um, security measures is a big part, and again, it's a low hanging fruit. There are breach notification laws in every state and there's certainly ones in Colorado. There are security requirements in Colorado. Make sure that if you are collecting personal data, folks, you are keeping it safe. Generally, as startups, you're dealing with third-party data management solutions. So if you have AWS or Google or something like that, they are going to meet those security requirements. But if you're storing your customer's data on your computer hard drive, it's something to think about. And then the final two I have is opt-out and opt-in. Colorado is an opt-out state for most things. I'll get to that in a second. But what that means is you are allowed to process someone's data, but you need to give them the option of saying stop it. Right? You are allowed to, you sell some, something to someone and they give you your email, you're allowed to send them a marketing email, but you need to have an unsubscribe option. You need to give them the option to opt out of that. Some states require an affirmative opt-in. Right? They need to tell you, yeah, go ahead, email. That's the difference between opt-out and opt-in. Colorado requires opt-in measures for certain highly sensitive information. You know, children. If you know one of your customers is a ch child, you need to have an affirmative opt-in. They need to affirmatively tick the box saying, yeah, my parents are allowing me to do this, or I am the parent and I'm allowing my child to do this. If it is uh, sensitive data, and that has a definition under the CPA, um, race, sexuality, sexual orientation, gender, that kind of information, if you're processing that kind of information, it needs to be an affirmative opt-in. And figuring out what, what data you're collecting and whether it's an opt-in or opt-out data is pretty low hanging fruit. And then final, internal deadlines. There are certain deadlines in the CPA for responding to, to inquiries, whether that is a regulator inquiry or a data subject access request. You know, in Colorado, if someone says, hey, please delete my data, you have 45 days to do it. 
can be extended another 45 days under certain measures, but you should know and have a process in place to respond to those requests, action those requests within the deadline. If you miss that deadline, you could be fined by the AP office. How much? Uh, <laughs> the, the penalties, um, they go up and down depending on what it is, right? If you are routinely ignoring data subject requests from thousands of people, it could go into a percentage of your revenue. If it's one or two, you're probably going to get a stern warning. Uh, so it really depends on, on where you're looking. Yeah? Are there any nuances related to anonymizing the data? So if you have it, um, large pool of customer data, and now you want to anonymize it and then delete the, the personal actual record? Yes, and this is tricky. Um, Personal, personal information, so the information that's subject under the CPA is information that can be associated with an identifiable individual. That's PI, yeah, right? You gave me your email address, whatever. You, we anonymize it at star, 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 star at gmail.com. Is that anonymized? Yes. So therefore, it would not be subject to the law. However, you need to be very clear and uh, understanding of your anonymization techniques. There are plenty of studies out there that says anonymization does not work. <laughs> and, you know... The, the law itself says that's fine, but you need to make sure that if you are de-identifying or anonymizing it, you are confident in that technology and you are confident that you are actually getting out of personal information. Now the other thing is Colorado does require certain uh, data protection impact assessments. These are internal documents that you have, right? You're not turning them over to anybody. These are assessments that you are making on highly risky behavior certain processing activities that might be a problem. So, for example, going back to the sensitive information, if you are routinely processing someone's national identity, you might think about doing a DPIA for that, say this is how we're protecting it, this is how we're complying for the law. It's something to save your skin. You only turn it over if the AG starts coming at you for how you're processing that data. I would say a similar thing for anonymization. That, that can be risky because it is a little bit of a gray area, so if that's a huge part of your data processing, I would suggest that you do a DPA. Thanks. Yeah. Um, before I move on, uh, just a couple of things on the CPA in general. Uh, the CPA borrows a lot from other states. It is very similar to Virginia's law. It's very similar to the California law. It's very similar to the European law. Now, as I mentioned, in Colorado specifically, the first question is scope and affordability. If you are processing 100,000 data from 100,000 Colorado residents, this applies for you. If you generate, and this is a weird wording, if you generate over $25 million from the sale of personal information, even if you are under that $100,000 limit, the CPA applies to you. The sale in Colorado, that's defined as exchange of personal information for money or anything of monetary value. One uh, example that we came up with recently is there was this company that uh, aggregates uh, employee compensation. They put out this report on employee compensation. One of the things they say is, hey, give us all your employee data and we'll give you a discount on this report at the end of the year. And that is a sale. They're not Chain, no money is changing hands, but they got a discount on that. And so therefore, it is a sale, and because in aggregate it was over the, over the $25 million, that type of activity applies under Colorado law. And then that subject was, uh, or that company was subject to the law. The other uh, interesting thing about Colorado law is they do have a somewhat expansive view of what sensitive information is. Um, now, I mentioned before that it is race, gender, um, health information. Uh, it explicitly calls out children. Now, a lot of other com uh, state laws will have special provisions for um, you know, the processing of children data. This is explicitly called out in the CPA as highly sensitive data. So that's one thing that you, you should keep in mind. Um, now, should I go a little bit more in depth onto the provisions or you know, how it differs from others? Or should we move on and come back, get to the questions at hand? Sure. Um, and if you have any questions, please 
if you all do have any questions about specific applications. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to say that depends on the jurisdiction. Uh, there, there's a risk wherever you are because the way the law works is if you process that data, it counts, right? Um, regulators in different jurisdictions are going to be more or less aggressive in their enforcement of the law. The EU regulators are aggressive. <laughs> and that disclaimer is probably not going to go over well if you're processing a good amount one or two, again, they're probably not going to pay you much money because they're focusing on bigger companies. Right? Um, another thing to consider in enforcement and how, you know, how to react to regulator inquiries is this is all very new, right? The, the, the gold standard, the oldest one that we're really talking about is the EU GDPR, and that was 2016 enforced in 2018. That's not long ago. Colorado's starting now. They're still figuring it out. You know, we have discussions all the time as to what does Regulator X care about? And I don't think Regulator X knows what Regulator X cares about. You know, Colorado's just coming into effect now. It's been in effect for, what, two months now. The Colorado AG's office is, you know, hiring now for an associate attorney general in privacy. They're serious about it. They mean business, but at the same time, they're figuring out what their priorities are. So, again, I, I focus on a risk-based strategy. I think that compliance is important. I think privacy and in consumer trust as a business asset. But you should also look at, you know, what what the balance between building your business is and compliance. You don't want to go for 100% compliance and shut your business down. But you also don't want to completely disregard everything and get shut down by the AP's office with a $20 million fine. Um, and so here in Colorado, uh, I would say that the Attorney General uh, is building up right now. They are looking to enforce this, um, but like other regulators, my guess is they are going to start at the top. They're going to look at some big companies to take examples of and then filter it down. And they're going to hope that huge fines for big businesses will act as a cautionary tale for smaller startups to say, okay, noted, not going to do that. So en encryption would be would fall under the security measures. Um, Colorado and many of the other uh, laws require that you implement reasonable and industry standard security measures. Um, I would argue that encryption isn't part of that. Again, depending on what data you're processing, if it's sensitive data, absolutely, I would say a reasonable security measure would be encryption. But it doesn't call it out specifically. Encryption at rest or um, like in transit or both? I, again, it's, it's, it's a question of risk. Since it doesn't call it out specifically, there is, you know, up in the air as to what a reasonable security measure is. At this point, considering where we are technologically, I would argue at both, or at, rest, at rest and in transit is reasonable. Um, and again, that's another one of those low-hanging fruit. It costs money. It's not free. It's an extra step for you to take. But if you encrypt at rest and not in transit and someone hacks that data as it's going to someone else, you're going to deal with a bigger headache than, than you would otherwise. Is there precedent around what's reasonable? I mean, do they point to NIST or like how do they how do they draw that line? Yeah. So um, again, I'll differentiate between regulations here. In Colorado, they haven't gotten there yet, okay. um, but industry standard is what they they go for. If you look at some of the other laws, California, um, EU, Brazil, which have been around a little bit longer. Those kind of industry standards, NIST is a very good option. If, you're, if you comply with the NIST standards, if you're you know, NIST compliant, that's going to be fine. You're going to meet that threshold. Um, same thing if you have an ISO certification. If you have a third-party certification of any type, that's going to go a long way in arguing, OK, this horrible thing happened. We were breached. But here's the reasonable steps we took to prevent it in the first place. Thanks. So the, um, you know, when you're talking about uh, sensitive data and like race, uh, ethnicity, gender, like, I feel like it's, you know, I don't know, 
And, and, and those quote unquote sensitive things, those are more important to encrypt than say like name? So, so yes, because a name is not considered sensitive information. Um, you know, I think that if you are only encrypting your sensitive information and not encrypting your non-sensitive personal information, you could arguably be compliant with the law. Like, I, there's nothing in the law that says, hey, you can't, you can't encrypt one and not the other. Um, but again, if something happened and you had a data breach of non-sensitive personal information that you failed to encrypt, I think that's inviting trouble. All right, Kathleen. Let's, let's go ahead. Okay. Um, so I'm going to move on to more like, um, more like in movies, actionable advice of what you do to kind of help your company move along in this way, right? So you two have got excellent background on the, the legal requirements or how to think about those. Um, and I do have just one comment to kind of follow up on some of the questions and, and the discussion we've had before. As Chris was saying, a lot of this is still kind of being defined, right? Like nobody really knows where this is going to go. And so as a startup, when you're beginning your business and you're thinking about how is it that you want to build out your approach to data? It makes it a little hard, right? Where the, the, the goalposts are constantly moving, the ways in which um, sensitive data, for instance, in the Colorado and the CPA, the definition of sensitive data <coughs> has changed, right? Like, and the way we're thinking about personally identifiable information, we used to talk about PII like it was a real thing and there were ways that we could talk about what made that PII. That's also changing. So the way in which we think about personally identifiable information is not the same as it was 10 years ago. It's not nearly as concrete as it was 10 years ago. And what we think about sensitive information is also legally changing. And so when you look at the Colorado, like the CPA, when you look at the CPA, one of the things that the CPA did was insert language around inference of sensitive data. So if you're collecting data about somebody that could be geolocation data, it could be data about their spouse. You know, you could have that HR team and you want to put together an invitation for a party that you're doing and so you ask for the names of their spouses. Now you might have information that you can infer about your employees whether they're regarding their sexual orientation because you know the name of their spouse, right? And so the way in which we infer sensitive data also is starting to change under CPA. And so one of the best things you can do to protect yourself is really understanding your data and having a really good data map within your company. Um, so as a quick show of hands, how many of you have undertaken a data mapping exercise in your company? Okay, so this is, this is where we, we normally would first start, right? Like where is it that you have data? What kind of data are you collecting? And then how is it that you want to treat that data in the future? And so in data mapping, um, the questions I normally work with are, who, what, why, where, when, and how, to keep it simple, right? So, who? Whose data are you collecting? Are you collecting business data? So business, like, you know, relationship with a potential partner? Or are you collecting personal data on a consumer? <coughs> who, the other who you want to know is, who in your company has access to that data? And this has been a critical point of failure consistently over time in the companies that we've worked in, and even in the US government, think Snowden. Who has access to the data that you're collecting, right? You need to know these two things first. Um, next, what kind of data are you collecting? Is it sensitive data? Is it financial? Is it um, data about your you know, partners? Think about if you're running a marketplace. What kind of data are you collecting on behalf of your partners? Um, is primarily your data HR data? And so here you're gonna start thinking about classifications of data. So how are you gonna bucket the data that you have into more manageable buckets and then you can start inferring what are the areas that you need to be more careful with. Um, why? Why are you collecting the data and how are you going to be using that data? Really critical question. If you're collecting data that you don't plan on using, why are you using up your resources collecting data you don't plan on using, and why are you storing data that could get you in trouble that you don't actually need, right? So how do you plan on using the data? Why are you collecting the data that you get? Where? Where do you store the data? Um, 
where do you access your data? So where are your data access points? And where do you sell the data that you're collecting if you happen to sell your data? Um, and on storage too, like, like there are some protections that you might get by working with uh, third party vendors like AWS, but they are not actually in charge of your data. So you cannot write off all of your responsibilities just because you get a third party vendor that stores your data. You still have employees that might have access to the data. You're still collecting that data. They are not in charge of protecting your data. You are. Um, when? How long is it that you actually need to keep that data? At what points in the journey? So at what points in the customer journey or in your contact with your customers are you actually collecting data? And then how, the how I, I talk about here is just what are the legal requirements? So how are you going to think about that data? Not if you can tackle that, like you have tackled more than most, right? Because data mapping sounds simple, but it is actually complex. The next piece, so after you've tackled data mapping for your company, and this is something that you can do internally, you can do it with a consultant, you don't have to do it with a lawyer, it doesn't have to be a super expensive process, although it might be time does not have to be a super expensive process to do. The next thing you need to decide is what is your approach as a founder to data? Is your approach principles based? Are you going to think about this is what is important to me and my company, so regardless of what the law says, these are the ways in which we're going to treat the data, right? And most of the time if you take a principles based approach, it's going to be flexible, you're not gonna hit all the requirements every place you might operate, but you're going to have a defense for any sort of regulatory attack that might come towards you, right? You're going to have a defense of principle based approach. It's the most flexible. The other is, and it's the more stringent one, sometimes the more difficult to implement, is to pick the most stringent law out there that might apply to your data now or in the future. So a lot of companies have taken the GDPR approach. Everywhere that they, that they operate, they just go with GDPR and they figure if they're complying with GDPR, it's such a high bar that pretty much they're capturing anything else that may happen outside of California. Um, and that's the kind of the most defensive approach that you might take. And the third approach that you might take, and it's also legitimate, is what can I get away with? That is a, another approach. What is it that I can get away with? And that might be the best thing for starting out, because while you're starting out, you might need to think about, I need to have a company that I build that I then need to defend, right? So 99 problems are the same one. So just, you know, but you need to have a cognizant recognition that this is the approach that you're taking. And within that, are there certain, kind of the low hanging fruit that Chris was talking about, are there certain ticks that you can cross off your list that will then allow you to go focus on your business and have this in the back of your mind that when I reach a certain threshold, I'm going to have to think more seriously about what it is that I'm doing and what I'm building and how I'm managing these things. Um, so in that, recommendations, right? So those are the two big things. What, how are you gonna manage data mapping? What is your approach going to be for your company for data management? Um, and with that, some recommendations that I have would be, number one, decide your risk tolerance for data. We are all founders. We all have a certain innate tolerance for risk. But that tolerance for risk may not extend to privacy so you need to think about, is my tolerance for risk the same when I'm thinking about how I manage the data and where I'm running on legal compliance as it is in other parts of my business? Maybe yes, maybe no, right? Um, think about what are your goals for your company. Do you want your goals, especially when you think about data, to be build an attractive company for acquisition? And if so, what do my acquisition targets value when they think about data and what is it that I need to build so I fit their model. Um, number two, reliability for partners. If I'm a B2B company, do I need to have certain compliance check marks in, in my list before I can sign a big client? And if so, or a big partner. If so, what are those and what does that require, right? And the third is if I'm a B2C company, what is my reputation? What is the reputation I want to and what then do I need to do on the back end to make sure that the reputation I'm putting forward is held up by the actions I'm taking by um, Next recommendation, learn your obligations because ignorance will not be a defense. Um, analyze your risk to the business. Is your risk compliance or is your risk actually 
actually the confidentiality of your information? Are you protecting yourself against legal action, or are you protecting yourself against employees that might leave your company and take your data with them? Are you building protections because you want to make sure you don't get hacked by your competitors, or your competitors don't have access to your information? One of my um, clients had was working in a system where they built in, they didn't pay the money to have access for all of their employees that needed access to certain software that contained their partner data and their customer data. And so as they had employee turnover, they never changed those passwords. And their, and their competitors then had a complete picture of what was happening in real time within their company. So when you're thinking about privacy, it's not just what fine am I going to face, it is what am I putting on the line that might compromise my business in the future. Um, and then, once you've kind of thought about all of these different things, decide an approach, because you're gonna have two different angles to your approach. One is going to be your external facing angle. This can most often be handled with external counsel if you don't have an in-house counsel team. So, get the legal minimum. Have a lawyer help you write your privacy policies. Make sure that your external facing um, privacy components are up to the standards that you've decided you want to meet, right? And then the second is internal. What is the culture that you want to build internally to your company around the way you treat data? And so is it certain, certain employees only get access to hash data or encrypted data? Or is it that all of your employees have access to X, Y, Z? What are the different, and you know, the culture around passwords or the security things you're building up? What are the trainings you're offering to your employees about the way that they treat the data that your company uses? Um, so those would be my, my, my top recommendations. And if you have any questions. Yeah, I want to facilitate some, some questions between the three of us, unless there are any other questions for Kathleen. Go ahead. So the first thing I would say is definitely have an understanding of your data. Have a good data map and understand the different classifications of data that you're managing. Um, that's the most important thing. And then have an understanding of what are the obligations that may or may not apply to you, right? So the, the most important thing I think about data mapping is that helps you build out your system. Um, and systems are very difficult to re-engineer, right? So when, and this is one of the reasons why the principle-based approach to privacy management is popular, is because you're not actually building your system for a law that may become outdated very quickly, or a law that's very geographic sensitive, right? So um, that first thing is actually understanding your data, being able to classify it, and then thinking about what are the principles you want to apply generally for that, for the data and the way you manage it. Because you, the last thing you want to do is go back and re-engineer your systems. Yeah, I, I had to add to that. I think that's a, a, a great piece of advice. Um, but also going back to figuring out what your data strategy is internally and externally. How do you want to present yourself? And presenting yourself through a principles-based approach is a great way to do it. You know, you start now and you're telling your customers we're being transparent, we're getting your consent, we're, you know, we're being responsible ethical data brokers or data processors. If that is how you're starting, later compliance, when you do hit that 100,000 mark, is going to be fairly easy. Um, that being said, there are worlds in which you are focused mainly on growing your business and putting that external promise out there might not be beneficial for you. Um, and to that end, I'd say, say what you do and do what you say. Because <laughs> if you say, hey, we're doing X, Y, and Z, and, and you grow, and all of a sudden you don't have the capacity to do that, that's where you're going to get in a lot of trouble. Yeah, how do you communicate privacy policies, and, you know, <coughs> CPA, and getting informed consent? And so I think it starts with culture. 
So what type of culture do you have? I mean, uh, I'm curious how many people in here, you don't have to raise your hand, but have access to previous data from previous companies. Uh, you don't have to raise your hand, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, uh, lots of people, right? And in some cases, the records, you know, the number of records over, right? The, the AD, AG, I'm not sure that they have case law about companies or previous, you know, uh, that have data, so. Um, I think the culture, like, Hey, do you have two-factor authentication uh, in your entire company, right? You don't think about privacy as like two-factor authentication in your entire company, personally, for all your employees. Or uh, do we have TOTP? You guys are talking a little bit about encryption. It's, we're getting a little bit in the weeds. But the, uh, uh, as founders, thinking about is my company uh, privacy-focused as a business, you know, as a competitive edge, or am I just trying to comply? And you can reach out to the AG's office, that, you know, the, uh, as panelists have said, they talked about, the, the, the law has only been implemented since July. So that's very, very new. And so this whole time period, everyone who's in here is listening, you're ahead of the curve. If you're starting to think about your company from a privacy, you know, a, a privacy perspective, you're ahead of the curve. And another question that, that I posit to the, uh, to the panel and to all of you is, we have piecemealed state, but do we think that there could eventually be federal regulation? Right, if and when, and I'll pose that. What are your, what are your all's thoughts there? Um, I do have thoughts on that. <laughs> um, I get there in a second, but uh, just one last thought on steps you should take, and this goes back to doing a data map and understanding your data, is figuring out whether you're considered to be a controller or a processor. This is a fundamental part of the law that we probably should have touched on a half hour ago. Um, if you're a controller, you own the data, right? You are a B2C company, they, you know, your customer gives you their name and email and address, you are the controller of that data. If you are a B2B business and you know, your business partner is sending you somebody else's data, you're going to be a processor. And understanding that distinction for each subset of your data, you can be a controller and a processor in different areas, but understanding that distinction, even if the CPA doesn't apply to you right now, Knowing that making that part of your data map will make future compliances. Now, to the question of federal legislation, there's been like 30 potential federal bills passed in there or, or presented in the last two years. It's, it is a hot topic that everybody cares about and nobody can agree on. Part of that is because it's hard to agree in Congress. <laughs> and part of that is we've got something like 28 states who put a ton of work into their privacy laws and they don't want to see them preempted by a federal law and then essentially go away. So even if there is a federal understanding on sort of the minimal, minimum principles-based obligations for businesses, there's a huge, huge dispute as to whether a federal law would preempt the state laws. Meaning, you know, the federal law is passed. If you would comply with the federal law, you don't really need to care about the other laws. Um, I think that that is going to be a topic of conversation that we should continue to look at. And in five years, we'll revisit. We'll all come back here and I'll say in five years, we should continue talking about this federal law because I don't think it'll, I think it'll be a constant topic of conversation that never actually goes. Mm. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think, you know, when I, so I got my start in all of this as a lobbyist in DC and, you know, more than two decades ago. And at the time, there was this appreciation for, I mean, at that time, there was basically no regulation when you talked about internet or technology. Like, there was, nothing was even being considered. You couldn't figure out what it is that, that anyone wanted. Google had two whole people in their DC office, <laughs> right? Because at that time, people thought technology was going to save the world. And so why would you want to regulate something that is a public good? 20 years later, we're living under the shadow of what big technology companies have done with our personal information and the anger that that has caused and the reflection that that has made across states who take action. Um, but at the federal level, I think the danger that, that we all in this room would face from a federal law is that the reason we would get a federal law is because the big companies decided it was in their competitive advantage to have a federal law that locked out competitors. And that is the reality. That's the, I think the only way we're going to get to a federal law is if we can get everyone to agree that what we have right now in terms of the way companies treat personal information is what we want 
into the future. Um, and that really closes the door on a lot of innovation. And that is part, has always been part of the debate in the United States as to why we have not moved forward in a federal regulation because we, we want this culture of innovation. And the fact that we've had a regulatory permissive state in this country from the beginning is the reason why almost all technology companies come from here and not from Europe. And so I think there's a lot of culture that goes behind it. And there is more of a threat of a privacy law becoming a barrier for entry. And that, that would be the only reason why we'd get it done. The other thing I'd add there is that um, the FTC right now, the Federal Trade Commission is kind of like the default privacy regulator in the US. There's no federal law. But the FTC can go after companies for what they consider unfair business practices, which would include various privacy matters. So if you say, I do X in my privacy notice, and you don't actually do that, the FTC technically could be coming after you for privacy-related things. Now, that is generally an issue for big companies. You know, we're talking Google, Meta, whatever, not startups. But um, that might also be a barrier to a federal law in that a lot of folks are going to say, look, we already have some form of federal regulator. We don't need to continue doing this. I just have one comment. Uh, uh, last week, Kevin Kelly, who is the chairman of the Federal Trade Commission, was talking about the fact that Happen to be a Brazil expert, so I can tell you this. I worked. I was the executive director of the Brazil U.S. Business Council. Um, Brazil is that primarily Brazil stands alone. They have a very different culture of the way in which they approach things as a government. Um, President Rousseff was very upset to find out she had this bite off. Very upset, and there has been a backlash against everything Western in technology in Brazil since that time. And even a little bit before, which goes into a history that has to do with law enforcement and the way the United States doesn't share information with other countries and the way technology companies have hid behind that for many decades. Um, but Brazil has been trying to equalize the technology landscape of the world um, and is definitely a made in Brazil first type of leader. And that is one of the big cultural reasons why you've seen Brazil move forward with a privacy law. So do you see a world, and I'm asking you to turn the tea leaves a little bit, but do you see a world where there's data havens and people are setting up their data centers in places that are like not, you know, not subject to these laws and legislation? Uh, in some respects, possibly, but uh, these obligations, they don't really care about where you keep the data. They care about whose data you Whose need. data it is. So if you take a bunch of data from Colorado residents and you go ahead and put it in Mali, right? Yeah. It's still going to apply. And you could get dinged by the Colorado EG for you know, stuff that you're doing or not doing in Mali to that data. So it is, it is geographically economic. The other thing I'll, I'll mention is that internationally, there has been a huge push to make sure that transfers between countries are done appropriately. Yeah. GDPR started this. They have adequacy decisions saying, hey, you can move it to Brazil because their laws are adequate. For a long time, there's been a back and forth between the US and Europe saying it's adequate, it's not adequate. They have all these different things going on. Um, but they're not alone. I, mm. If you have uh, collecting Chinese data, there's a whole set of regulations and obligations to transfer data out of, out of uh, China. Same thing for India, same thing for Saudi Arabia. And what that's doing is it's actually kind of taking the opposite approach to what you're talking about, is it's creating a push for data localization laws, where you collect data from China, it's so difficult to transfer that out to your hub in the US or wherever, that you might as well just set up a whole new data lake in China. <laughs> um, and it's, it's tricky because a lot of these 
regulations are sort of, they're with Brazil, made in Brazil first. They're, they're egotistical to some extent, and they want to be the ones doing it. And so you now you have a bunch of competing transfer obligations that are making it difficult to take data out of that country. But now all the other, these other countries are thinking about that same thing too. Um, so it's, it's gonna, how, how it evolves internationally is gonna be very, very tricky. I don't think there are gonna be data. I would say, just sorry, just add one thing to that. Um, I think on the, the data haven and the international transfers, it also depends on, like one of the reasons why companies have tried to keep their data out of certain jurisdictions is because of their um, desire not to let that government get access to that data. And so that also plays a role in terms of um, what are the, and because the transfer of data is controlled by treaty in the United States, and so there's a treaty between the Senate and other countries as well that will have to do with, like, if you want law enforcement data, you have to go through a federally approved process, and that has been a very clunky, historically um, irksome situation for a lot of countries, but in the United States, we also have, um, you know, at, at Yahoo, when I worked at Yahoo, we had a history of having turned over information about users to the government that turned out to be human rights activists, and those people were either killed or life imprisoned mm -hmm. because of information that they got from Yahoo's legal team. And so that that is something that also plays in. Like, where do you keep your data? How do you keep your data out of the hands of bad actors that might also be governments? Yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about the regulatory regimes. How, how do you all think uh, startups can strike a balance between, I mean, data is obviously valuable, uh, and then the complying with the regimes. How do startups make decisions on balancing valuable PII and compliance? I think the first step there is to understand the why of your data processing and what your, the nature of your business is, right? If your business focuses on, if you're a data broker, right, you're not selling any tangible good, you're not providing you know, meal delivery services or anything like that. You are buying and trading data. That's going to put you a little bit more in the, in the crosshairs of right? They're going to be a bit more aggressive with you on these obligations. If you're setting up a marketplace and, and you know, you're an independent seller on eBay or something like that, you know the, the aggressiveness of the regulators are going to be a little bit less. And then similarly, again, if you're a pure data processor, you have, uh, you're a B2B business, you're not dealing with any consumer directly, you're gonna be even lower down. So understanding the nature of your business is gonna go a long way in deciding where your risk tolerance is going to be when it comes to potential compliance issues and how much you want to focus on, you know, compliance out of the way, I'm building my business and I'll deal with that later, versus it's in incredibly important for me to make sure that I am compliant from the outside. I have a, I have a question about um, sort of the interaction between federal um, federal uh, bodies versus these kind of state-based privacy things. Because, so for example, like HUD's affordable housing programs has certain requirements on keeping data around waiting lists for X amount of years. And if someone asks to be removed, you're like, tough potatoes, you can't do it. Um, and so is that like the correct response? Like we can delete your account, but not your application due to this other federal requirement? Yeah, so two things on that. First, um, in Colorado and all the other laws, but speaking about Colorado, there are exceptions. You have PI, personal data, that's in your system that would otherwise apply and, and you'd be subject to the CPA. But if it is medical data, HIPAA, there are exceptions for specific federal legislations, and there are, there's a whole list of them. Second, when you come to that specific example of a deletion request, those deletion obligations of the company are subject to other legal obligations that they have. So if you are required to hold on to a specific set of data under X, Y, or Z law, you would just respond and say, hey, we're gonna delete everything we, we can. We're obligated to keep this under this law What if it's just policy, not a law? You know what I mean? Like, I think yeah. that's always the, the problem with all this stuff. It's like, yeah, the HUD auditor might decide that, you know, they really care about something, and it's more like 
policy specific than law specific. And so. So obviously a gray area and depending on how strict a policy it is, you know, there you have your laws and then you have your implementing regulations. And if it is a policy that was created through the implementing regulations, I think you're safe in saying, hey, you know, I can't delete this data. Okay. If it is the guy, you know, the director gave a press conference and said, hey, I'm, I care about this, but it's nowhere formal, yeah. I, don't, I, wouldn't, I would say it probably does not fall under that exception. Um, just real quick, what would be the easiest way to keep track of all these new laws that are coming out? You said there's 10 states, and what do we do with the next 40? Correct. And this goes to, do you take the most conservative approach? This is where, in our conversation, I'm hoping you're able to make decisions for your companies on wh where do I fall, right? Am yeah, I going 100? You're doing like the strictest example. Uh, GDPR. I mean, yeah, you just go to that and, um, I mean, do you have a... Texas comes out with something new. They have. Then how do you find out that they're the right state? Do you, uh, does your company have GDPR, or do you have, like, <laughs> compliance professionals or privacy within your company? It's just me right now. Just you. I would say, yeah, figure out what your, your gold standard is. If you decide that you are GDPR compliant, or even if you decide you're Colorado compliant, you're going to be 90% compliant with the rest of the state laws that are coming out. The exception being California, because they always like to be different. There's a lot of additional things you need to do there. But if you say, look, I'm good on Colorado, and Montana's one is, kind of, is going to be effective next year, you're going to be 99%. Yeah. Now, there are certain things sorry, certain things you need to do, update your privacy policy, right? And say, hey, Montana's now effective. This privacy policy also applies to Montana. And it's a small change, but it's something that, that you should maintain. Another thing is the Attorney General wants people to comply. We're in this time frame where you can establish relationships. Typically, I feel like there's a hostility between companies and the and enforcement agencies. But we're in this kind of, you know, uh, uh, starry-eyed period where they're still trying to figure out, too. So. You could send an email to the AG's office and say, hey, like I've done this, this, and this, and this. And now you've established a relationship where you can not only you know, comply, but you know who they are, and they know who you are. And you know, if you have some sort of relationship with a regulatory body, I'm not saying they won't, but there's an established relationship, and there are benefits to that as opposed to, um, if, yeah. So. And again, based on your risk, there's also drawbacks. You know, if you want to fly under the radar, that's, you know, you can do that, but getting a face-to-face -face with the AG is not the best way to fly under the radar. Yeah, I think you have to, that, that's another, it goes back to what is your risk? What is your risk tolerance for privacy? Um, what is your approach to privacy policies? And in all likelihood, if you're the only person who's doing it, your need for tracking everything is, I don't know what you do. So don't take me, this is not a lawyer's advice. But your risk is probably relatively low. When you get to the point where you have that problem, then there are resources available to you where you can say, like, hey, I did my best. Normally, if you're doing your best and you're doing something, it's probably going to be enough to get you more time to do what you need to do. And so also know that in most of these conversations, like, if, like, don't, I wouldn't live with, like, the, like you know, fear of, retribution because you didn't follow all these different state laws that came out, um, most of the time it's a conversation where it's, we don't want to kill the businesses that are flourishing in our state. You have violated this, or you've come to our attention, and we'd like to have a conversation with you. Then I just want to plant this idea in your mind right now. As, like I said, I was a lobbyist for a long time. I've dealt with a lot of regulators, like my bread and butter. If you get in that conversation, always say to them, number one, it has always been my intention to comply. These are the things that I've done. Always know what you've done. Even if it's very little. I sent an email to my employees telling them not to share information, not to download things on their, on their laptops, whatever it is. Like, ha just know that you have a little bit of a story to tell. And next, you always have the right to ask for more time. And always ask for twice as much time as you think they're going to give you. So if you think the law says you, you get 18 months to like fix it, on my case, I need four years. Okay, maybe they're not going to give you four years, but that's what big companies do. Big companies never come in and say, I can do this for you in 180 days. No, I'm going to need four years to do something that probably could get done in 60 days, right? But it's the shuffling of resources that may cause competitive damage to your company. So if you ever do just 
file away for your back of your head, get in a conversation with a regulator, ask for what may seem to you a ridiculous amount of time and have a reason for why you need it and trust that you will get the time you need to come into compliance if you are not a really terrible violator. Again, that is not a lawyer's advice, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> Generally speaking, I would advise on just taking a look every six months, every year. You should be, uh, you know, revising your privacy policy on an annual basis. Maybe revising means no changes, but you've looked at it, right? And I would use that as an opportunity to just go and look and say, what are the flaws that we have? Are there any differences? Do I just need to say, okay, you know, Maine is now in this, right? What, whatever the, the actual change may be. Um, IAPP, the National Association of Privacy Professionals, they have a state law tracker that is kept up to date. It's very good. You can do it in a, in a table or by map, um, and it's always up to date. I'd say just you know, set a reminder on your calendar and say, hey, check it out. See if I need to Yeah, there. What's that? The IAPP? IAPP. Yeah, and there's a, a, a lobbyist will use a, a there's a, a free, uh, free uh, tool called Fast Democracy. And that looks, that's a great tool where you can go and see, uh, it's, it's limited, right? It's a freemium type product, but you can see what laws, you can type in privacy and see who's, who's putting what privacy for. The problem is that, I mean, you look at that law and that's a legislature and then it go, has to pass all the law and then get an implementation, and go to the enforcement, whoever the enforcer is. And so there's some time from like, you know, the Colorado Privacy Act was in 2021 and here we are in 2023, you know, 24 months later from when it's actually starting to implement. So, but that's, So um, I don't, I'm not aware of any uh, smart device specific law, um, but there, you know, depending on what your smart device is, a lot of times it's going to be gathering information. And if it is gathering information that again is identifiable, right, um, it could fall under one of these privacy laws. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is there's burgeoning AI regulations coming out, um, and depending on the nature of the smart device, it could fall under an AI regulation as well. Um, so I mean, that's it. It really depends on what kind of data is being collected. At that point. Well, it also depends on how you're collecting it, right? So you have a smart light bulb user registers the smart light bulb that, you know, my name is Chris Keeler and here's my smart light bulb and you are, you know, uh, maintaining logs of how often I'm putting my lights on, you know, my name is certainly personal identification, my email would be personal information, uh, you know, the, the logs of usage, you have to think about that because the, the, the main thing as you mentioned before is inferential data. If that could be used to infer something about the individual it might fall under. Logs of light bulbs, I'm not seeing it right now, but you know, I don't want to rule it out. Either. Yeah, it's also of course going to be dependent on what is the smart device. Does it have any sort of health application? Is it a light bulb that helps with um, fighting depression or, you know, those, it's, it's going to be very specific to what is the device as to whether or not that data that you're collecting um, would fall under a I, 
it, it's a it's a risk question, yeah. right? You know, it, if you if you have data and you are holding data somewhere, there is a risk that you're going to get a breach, right? And if you are you know hoarding a whole bunch of sensitive data, you know, cyber insurance sounds pretty good um, because the the regulators are going to look at that more strongly. There's also uh, breach notification laws that's separate from the CPA and the CCPA and all these. Each state has their own breach notification law. Whereas if you do get hacked, there's a whole slew of things you need to do to inform the AG's office, inform consumers, depending on the extent of the company. Um, so, I mean, for me personally, I would say that step one is evaluate your risk tolerance and you know, the cost versus risk uh, ratio there. The second thing is keep an eye on how many individuals you are collecting data on. Um, you know, the state breach laws go from 10,000 at a minimum up to 100,000 at a minimum. They're all over the place. But if you're starting to collect data on enough individuals where you might be needing to you know, send out mailings to 50,000 different people about a potential breach, that's where cyber insurance might, might really come in handy. Yeah, and I think about operating, you know, dovetailing, I think about operating procedures in your company. So like if you have a single sign-on that's not super expensive to, to uh, implement, and then you have two-factor authentication, and then you're controlling all of your employees' access, you're not going to have something where five of your employees have 700,000 spreadsheet rows of PII sitting on their personal computers. Yeah, 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 yeah you hope, right, right. But you know, it's thinking about those processes, and I think back to culture. What type of culture do you want to implement to help Business you're running, right? Because, I mean, and different hackers are gonna. I've I've had the misfortune in my life of having to negotiate with hackers, and the different hackers have different intentions, right? And so different, int like, what is the risk that you're actually running with those? Do you have a security officer? What are you? What are the different things that you're running within your company? Are you running a profitable company versus, and like, how much of a target are you? I think there's a lot of things that would go into that measurement of when does cyber insurance actually make sense for company A, and even considering all those same things, maybe company B, it wouldn't make as much sense for them at that time. And I think they might need the 